it's, uh, it's easy to be discouraged. It's easy to be discouraged. Uh, and maybe uh, the reason we think that is, uh, or maybe at times the reason some people, not you, not you certainly, uh, might think that is because, uh, well, maybe you believe that there are just more reasons to be discouraged out there. I mean, does anybody watch the news? I mean, does, does anybody see what these kids are doing? Does anybody see this godless culture we live in? I mean, there are just more reasons to be discouraged, aren't there? Or, or to borrow Sharon's term from that song, more reasons to be disappointed. Maybe we feel that way. But it's not true. Uh, though it's easy for us to be discouraged and disappointed, uh, there are greater reasons uh, to be encouraged. Always. There are greater reasons for us to be positive. There are greater reasons for us to have a strong sense of security and confidence. There are greater reasons for us not to be discouraged and not to be disappointed. All of those reasons have to do with who God is. And who God is, is greater than all the reasons that we often become discouraged. So tonight, that is exactly what Psalm 36 is about. And that is our text this evening. In a world of discouraging things, greater reasons to be encouraged. We're going to read Psalm 36 together and dive right into the text. Psalm 36, I'm reading from the NIV, and I'll start in verse 1. In oracles within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked, there's no fear of God before his eyes. For in his own eyes he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. He's ceased to be wise and to do good. Even on his bed, he plots evil. He commits himself to a sinful course and does not reject what is wrong. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. The word of the Lord. This psalm is a fascinating psalm. All of the psalms are fascinating. I shouldn't say that, but this is a fascinating psalm broken into two main parts that we're going to look at with a concluding um, application for us this evening. And the two main parts are, on the one hand, the evil of the world, and on the other hand, the faithful love of the Lord. And so we're going to break the passage apart into those two main points, and that your first fill-in-the-blank tonight is the evil of our world. The evil of our world in verses 1 through 4. And this point, we're going to break into two parts, and there's two parts to it. Uh, and the first we see in verses 1 and 2, I'll read them again, which says this, uh, in oracles within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked, there's no fear of God before his eyes. For in his own eyes, he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. In these two verses, what we see is love of self replaces love, fear of God. Love of self replaces fear of of God in verses 1 and 2. Uh, Peter Craigie in uh, 
the word biblical commentary gives his own translation of these, of verse 2 anyway, and I like the, the, the idea here in verse 2. He says, uh, for he flatters himself too much in his own eyes to find his iniquity and to hate it. He flatters himself too much to, to find his iniquity and, and then to hate it. Can't even find it. Can't even see it. Uh, we see this in, in Scripture all over the place. Let's uh, turn back here in the Psalms to Psalm 14, verse 1. Psalm 14, verse 1. It's a very uh, popular verse. I'm sure you all know it very well. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their deeds are vile. There's no one who does good. Now, this, this passage here, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, is not really about atheism. Uh, this fool isn't actually saying, um, from what we can tell from other passages like this, he, he's not actually saying God doesn't exist. What he's, he's saying is that uh, there, there's no God who's going to hold me accountable. He lives as if there's no God. He lives as if there's no uh, Yahweh that Israel worships. And so he can get away with whatever he wants. It's, it's the course of life that he lives. It's probably not that he's an actual atheist. Um, there's no uh, Jewish God, at least. And he says there's no God. We see this also in Proverbs. You want to turn over to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. A passage, again, that I'm sure you all know very well. Proverbs 1, verse 7. Which says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord, right? Uh, but, second part of that verse is, fools despise wisdom and discipline despise it right so so in these passages you take them together and you get this picture of the fool or you get this picture of the wicked uh, and their wickedness they, they're so blinded by their own self-centeredness that they live as if God doesn't even exist and uh, they despise the goodness of this God in uh, Peter Craigie's commentary, he says this about this verse, that having no fear of God, he effectively blinded himself with self-adoration. Having then only himself to go by as a measure for morality, he was totally unable either to know or to hate his own iniquity. Having dispensed with the fear of God, which was the foundation of wisdom, as we read in Proverbs 1.7, he had become a moral cripple. He'd become a moral cripple. And that's what self-centeredness does for us. When we become self-centered, when we become so enamored with ourselves and our self-adoration, we become moral cripples. We, we can't see the truth. Augustine said, when I followed my lusts, a dark cloud came between me and the clear skies of truth. When we follow ourselves, we become so self-centered that we can't see the great truths of God and the great truths uh, of life that God has made for our world to exist in. When you think about our world today, you think about uh, the, the, this great example we have of this in our world today. And it, it might pass you by, but uh, I, I doubt it's passed you by. Our world today is so enamored with itself and its technological prowess, so infatuated with how creative we are. We're so infatuated with how incredibly uh, artistic, how in incredibly uh, brilliant, how incredibly uh, far we've come, and we're just self-aggrandizing all the time in our culture, all the time. And what happens? Well, mankind becomes then the standard for their own goodness and evil. 
And so today, uh, everybody's opinion about morality is, is just fine. Uh, who am I to say that any one of you could be wrong? Who am I to say that any one of you could do something wrong or wicked? Or uh, who, who am I to say? And, you know, we certainly are not anything like those old, decaying people that are just stuck in the past. We've come so far from their time. We gotta, we gotta get rid of them. You know, let them be in their little churches. Let them go to their Sunday evening services. But we are passing them by. Look at all we have done. This, this is the parable of our time. We're so self-adoring. They can't even see. Can't even see that something as simple as abortion would be wrong, let alone sinful, let alone murder. So infatuated with themselves that they can't even see that marriage is for a man and a woman, or that a man and a woman even exist biologically. So blinded by themselves, they can't see the most basic truths. This is the time we live in. But there's a caveat to this. In the psalm, uh, certainly it seems that David is talking about the wicked, people that are far out there, people that we would say uh, are also far out there in our culture that are described the same way I just described, uh, the, the kinds of people we're talking about that we would not include ourselves in. But uh, there's a caveat here, and we ought to go to that in Romans chapter 3, verse 18. Romans chapter 3. Verse 18. And we'll find something interesting about this passage that Paul uses. Romans 3.18. It comes at, uh, at a long list of Paul describing from Scripture, from several different Scripture passages, the wickedness of mankind. And he means all mankind. And in verse 18, he says this. There's no fear of God before their eyes. That's quoting Psalm 36. And who is Paul using it to talk about? Well, you all know in the context, Romans 3.23, right? We tell it to our kids. It's the first part of our gospel presentations, right? For all have sinned. Me? Me? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. No fear of God before my beautiful eyes? Come on, it can't be about me. Paul's applying it to all mankind. Th this is the state of mankind in sin. And so Psalm 36, while David is specifically directly referring to uh, wickedness in its full measure, you might say, and to wicked people outside of Israel, who don't have God's law, you could think of the Canaanites or whoever else. Uh, the, all of Scripture, and, and Paul in Romans in particular, applies this kind of a passage to you and me. And we know we have that same heart in us. Where the fear of God is not something that is normal for us, apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our life. We know we have that same heart that can be self-obsessed. So the great evil of our world that can cause us to be discouraged starts with a love of self that replaces the fear of God. But it continues, in our second point here, in lives that are consumed with evil and trouble. Lives that are consumed with evil and trouble. We see this in verses 3 and 4 in Psalm 36. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful, so are the words he speaks. He ceased to be wise and to do good, so mentally, uh, psychologically, spiritually, internally, he, he doesn't have wisdom. So he doesn't speak what's right. He doesn't think what's right or feel what's right, we could say. Uh, even on his bed, he plots evil and commits himself to a sinful course. So 
now he is, he is uh, premeditated, right? He is uh, focused on these things, planning uh, action to carry out, and he carries it out. He carries out a sinful course. It is meticulous. It is planned, right? Uh, this isn't uh, an accidental thing. And he does not reject what is wrong. So this, this describes somebody who internally, with the words of their mouth and with the actions and the plans of their life, is consumed with evil and with trouble. With evil and with trouble. And we can see here uh, a similar thing to what we have talked about already, that you know, all mankind, when they become self-obsessed, uh, they become consumed with themselves and then therefore consumed with sin. Uh, in their, their deeds, in their thoughts, and in their words. Alexander Pope uh, says this in a uh, poem. He says, Vice is a monster of so frightful mien as to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too often, familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. And this describes somebody who has fully embraced uh, all sin in their life. And this uh, complete picture of a man so consumed in sin uh, describes, again, somebody who is, we would say, far down the road. Somebody that we would look at and say, man, there is just no hope at getting through to that guy. They are so bought in. They, they are so consumed with sin that I don't even know if I, I could get this person to believe God even exists. I don't know if I could even get this person to ever believe that sin is a real thing, that there is such a thing as evil. And once again, we point to ourselves. We, we were, uh, just had our newcomers orientation here, and uh, one of the newcomers, uh, a lot of you know her, Lynette Madrigal, she comes to the second service, she's come to first service too, Anyway, um, she, she, her question, we sat down at the table to eat after we had done, you know, the whole newcomer's orientation, sat down to eat, and she's like, Pastor Rick, I got a question for you. I'm like, all right, what is it? She's like, um, what about TULIP? And TULIP is the uh, acronym for the uh, uh, kind of five doctrines of Calvinism, right? And so we, we started talking about total depravity at the table, or uh, <laughs> eating dessert and, and uh and a meal. And the doctrine of total depravity means that, and of original sin, means that once Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, all mankind and every part of mankind has been thoroughly touched with sin. Total depravity means that not just somebody who has given himself totally over to a life of sin, but every single person on this planet after Adam is totally perverted with sin. Every part of you has been affected. Every part of you has been touched. Mind, right? Soul and body. Every part of you. So while we might not be giving ourselves completely over to all kinds of sins and, and plots for sin, we do have to confess once again that as Romans 3 tells us and as Roman 1, Romans 1 tells us, we too are a sinful people. We too are completely affected by sin. There is not one ounce of Rick Fodrell that is unaffected by sin, that has been reserved or set apart. And but for the work of the Holy Spirit in any of our lives, uh, we would continue to give ourselves over in sin. But by his grace, he's changing us. So here's a person that's totally consumed, and yet we all recognize that any one of us could be this person too. And with these two pictures, we get an idea of the evil that's in the world that we all know has, has been here, and it's been here ever since Adam. There are a world full of people who, uh, not all of which could be completely described this way uh, directly, but a world full of people who have no fear of God, a world full of people who are so self-obsessed that, that they 
fail even to grasp sin as a category. A, a world so full of people that are plotting evil all the time and are proud of it. And we could look at that and say we have a world full of reasons to be discouraged and disappointed and frustrated and fearful. But there's an answer to this world, a world that existed since Psalm 36 and since Genesis 3. There's, a, there's an answer, and the answer comes in the next part of the passage, and that's here in verse, verses 5 to 9. Our second point here is the greater love of our God, the greater love of our God. Uh, again, we're going to break this into now two parts. In the first part we see in verses 5 and 6, and we'll read those now. Verse 5. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. Now notice here in the passage, we, we have a unexplained contrast right away. We've just been talking about how horribly wicked uh, people can be in this world, and, and we recognize we have the same heart. But then all of a sudden, there's a shift, and, and our focus now shifts from down here to up at God. And at God's love in particular, his, this is his faithful love, his hesed love, his steadfast, loyal love. And notice what he says about it. First of all, in verse 6, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. God's love is based on his righteousness, is based on his goodness, is based on his character. And his character, right, is like the mighty mountains. It's immovable or impregnable. It's, it is uh, unshakable. It is mighty. And therefore, his faithful love towards us, it's infinite. Your second, uh, fill in the blank here, your part A, sorry, is that God's love is true and it's boundless. God's love is true and it's boundless. Boundless. So it's true, it's based in his righteousness. Sorry, I got a little ahead of you there. It's true because it's based in his righteousness. But it's boundless because God's righteousness and his goodness and, uh, is infinite. God's character is infinite, and therefore his love to you knows no bounds. It reaches to the heavens, to the, the, beyond the universe. It, it goes uh, beyond uh, the skies, his faithfulness to you. It cannot be measured. It can't be. It's inexhaustible, and it's unfathomable. Uh, Peter, or not Peter Craigie, D Derek Kidner says this about this passage. Here is a whole world to explore, a broad place to be brought into, unsearchable, impregnable, inexhaustible, yet for all that, welcoming and hospitable. It's only man's world that is cramping. Human fickleness makes a drooping contrast to this towering covenant love and faithfulness. Human standards, where all is relative, are a marshland beside the exacting, exhilarating mountains of his righteousness. Human assessments are shallowness itself in comparison with his judgments. Isn't that good? A.W. <laughs> Tozer says this about a similar thing, and I love this quote. It's my favorite quote about uh, our sin in relationship to God's goodness and love. Tozer says in uh, The Knowledge of the Holy, to abound in sin. That is the worst and the most we could or can do. The word abound defines the limit of our finite abilities. And although we feel our iniquities rise over us like a mountain, the mountain nevertheless has definable boundaries. It's so large, so high, it weighs only this certain amount and no more. But who shall define the limitless grace of of God. It's much more plunges our thoughts into infinitude and confounds them there. 
All thanks be to God for grace abounding. And that grace abounding might be to the chief of sinners, right? But who are we? Who are we to compare our sin or even the world's collective sins to the grace of an infinite God? Who are we? Who are we to look at the world and say, I just can't believe how awful things are. God, how can you stand this? To an infinite God who has an infinite, immeasurable amount of love to give to you and does at every moment and has demonstrated that on the cross. Who are we to be overwhelmed by a world that's full of sin? Do your worst and say that somehow that can reach or go beyond the love God has for us through Jesus Christ that is infinite, boundless. To abound in sin, that's the worst we can do, but it has limits. John Piper says it this way, Our sins are many and worse than we want to believe. God's mercy is bigger and more powerful than we could conceive. And that's the idea here of God's faithfulness reaches to the skies. It, it's, it's boundless and, it, and it's also unfathomable. We, we just can't. We can't compute it, can't measure it, and we can't even, we have a hard time describing it. That's the love that God has for us. So what's a reason we have to be encouraged in a world full of discouragement and full of evil and real evil that makes us frustrated, that makes us overwhelmed, that, that causes us to get red in the face? Well, number one, you have a God whose love is true and boundless boundless. Number two, God's love is caring and generous. God's love is caring and generous. We see this in verses seven to nine. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. Notice the word, uh, some of your translations say precious in verse 7. Uh, here it's translated priceless, uh, precious, priceless. Uh, it, it's a love that goes from this infinitely inexhaustible, uh, towering like a mountain love to this priceless treasure that we can almost hold in our hands uh, to a God who with that love that is inexhaustible, becomes a refuge that shadows us over with his wings, that, that comes very tenderly, delicately, and specifically to each one of us. Though, though he, his love is mighty and impregnable and, and like a mountain, it comes to us and cares for us. It, it gives us generously uh, a, a feast to live off of shelters us and gives us delight, gives us life, gives us light, everything that is good. He is willing to give to us, and, and he gives generously as a caring God. Psalm 56, 8 is another psalm I want us to go to to get a picture of this, and it's my one of my favorite passages to share with people on visits, and um, uh, some of you have probably heard me share it with you. Psalm 56, 8 says this. I'm going to actually, I'm gonna, the NIV is a little bit different. I'm going to read it from the, NI, the ESV. Um, you keep count of my troubles. You put my tears uh, in a bottle. Uh, are they not written? David, in this psalm, in Psalm 56, I think he recognizes and remembers about God that he is a God who is so faithfully loving to him that uh, even every tear God keeps a record of, God catches in a bottle, 
this infinite almighty God stooping down to David's face to not just wipe tears away, but to catch them, to catch them and record them in a book and in a bottle. And I've used this illustration before, but I love this illustration. If you can try to imagine the love of God for you and how intimate it is for you, that perhaps metaphorically speaking, it might be like this. When God takes you home into eternity, uh, he takes you to a room, and on the, the door to that room, it says your name. You open the door and walk in, and it's this long room with floor to ceiling on both sides, just row after row of tear bottles, back to front, bottom to top. In the middle of the room, there is a, a pedestal with a book, and it's, it's a pretty big book, it's pretty thick, and you open the book, and all that the book records is uh, every bottle and every tear in every bottle, why it happened, where it happened, and how God was there catching it. The whole room full. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, if I, if I tried really hard, I could think of, I don't know, a dozen or so times when I've really cried. I, I haven't written them down, but I guess I could. I could write them out, maybe make a little autobiography, Pastor Rick's tears. But that's probably the best I could do. And, and I'm not even going to attempt to speculate about how many times I've cried in my lifetime. And I'm not even going to attempt to, to conceive of how many individual tears I've cried. That's just weird. Nobody cares about themselves that much, and if they do, they've got a screw loose. But here is the God of the universe who he cares enough about you that he's pictured catching your tears, sealing them off in a bottle, writing them down in a book. He knows. He knows more about your troubles, and he cares more about you than you care about yourself. That's how much God loves you. That's how much he wants to overshadow you with his wing. That's how much uh, he wants to uh, give you drink from the river of his delights, to give you the fountain of life, to give you light so you can see the path ahead of you. Reason number one that we have reason, greater reasons to be encouraged, well, God's love is, is true, and God's love is uh, for you. Reason number two, that God's love is caring and it's generous. It's caring and it's generous. So what do we say to this? Well, our last fill in the blank is simply this. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Verses 10 to 12 say, Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. There's two ways we tell God to come to us. Number one, we ask him to come in our present distresses and trials and come in the times that we feel discouraged and we see the world around us and we say, my Lord, what is happening? Lord, come, help me now. And that's what David prays when he says, continue your love to those who know you. And, and David ought to know, and certainly he does, that the God who has infinite love will come. And he does come every time. But there's a second way we ask for God to come, and that come, Lord Jesus, is a come soon. Come soon, Lord Jesus. The end of this passage shows how God finally vanquishes his enemies. How God finally puts an end to all evil and all injustice in the world. All the things that fills our world up with wickedness and with frustration and discouragement. God finally, at the end of it all, verse 12, uh, will have victory. And all evil will be fallen and destroyed, not able to rise, thrown down. So we, we pray, come Lord Jesus. We don't just pray save. We, we ought to pray save every time. But we also pray come. 
we, we want God to save every possible person. We have family members and friends who are not saved, and we pray, God, save them. But as Christians, that's not all that we pray. We also pray, God, come. Lord Jesus, come. Come soon. We pray both of these things because we desperately want to see people saved, and we desperately want to see God have the final victory. And that brings us to the end of the book, Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 20, which says this, verse 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. That's how the book ends. And that's what we pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you. Thank you for your word that so clearly guides the way, that so beautifully expresses the love that you have for us that we so easily forget. We confess. We, we are blinded by our own sin. We're blinded by our own weakness in, in memory. We're blinded by our own uh, present difficulties that at times are, are really not much at all to complain about, but seem like a lot to us. And, and here we have you opening up before us an infinite, boundless supply of faithful love through your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, help us to see. Help us to see your light, which is truly light, and your love, which overcomes everything. And Lord Jesus, Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.